So welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people here uh, for our second official Stanford Online Algebraic Geometry Seminar. And we're really excited to have Kirsten Wickelgren talking today about the fact that there are 160,839 times one plus 160,650 times minus one, three planes on a seven dimensional cubic hypersurface. So uh, take it away, Kirsten. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, for the opportunity to get to give a talk. Um, as, as Ravi mentioned, I was a graduate student at Stanford, so it's, it's especially exciting to, to get the, the link back into Stanford. Um, this is all a joint work with Tom Bachman, who is here. So Tom, if you could unmute yourself and say hello to everybody, then we'll all know um, about you, please. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm sure you will tell them everything, so I will just pretend I'm not here. All right. Um, but, I'll go to uh, sleep, maybe it's a bit late here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the um, European uh, time zone. Uh, all right. Um, so the, the title is a specific case of um, uh, counting R planes on complete intersections. So let's, let's set up that count. Uh, so um, let's give ourselves a field to start with, and we'll give um, ourselves some homogeneous polynomials. They can be of different degrees if we like. Um, and we'll let X uh, be the, the zero locus, so X inside PN um, uh, will be the zero locus of these uh, homogeneous polynomials. And let's assume that X is a complete intersection. Uh, so uh, the dimension of X is um, uh, N minus J. Uh, so uh, um, we're gonna we're gonna count R planes, and uh, let's let's write down what an R plane is. Um, an R plane in X is um, uh, linear subspace p to the r inside p to the n, which also lies in x, and we're going to allow um, the linear equations cutting out our linear subspace to be in some uh, field extension e, so we can base change x to e, and um, and we'll have a an r plane in x, and we propose to count them. So field extension. Um, so uh, let's let's let um, GRRN be the Grassmannian parameterizing R planes in PN. Um, uh, PRs in PN, or equivalently. Um, uh, R plus one dimensional subspaces uh, W in an N plus one dimensional vector space. Um, and we can take uh, W can go to its projectivization and um, uh, we have a, a space, a scheme uh, uh, the Grassmannian parameterizing um, the R planes we want to count. Um, uh, let's also set up notation for the tautological bundle. So let's let S um, GR RN um, be the tautological bundle, um, which over the R plane um, projectivization of W has fiber uh, W tautological um, bundle. So the fiber over the point of the Grassmannian corresponding to W um, uh, is W. And um, for counting R planes and complete intersections, we care about the, um, say, D ice um, uh, uh, symmetric power of the dual. So the fiber over um, the point W is um, degree D polynomials. Um, 
on the on the vector space uh, uh, w. So we can um, uh, uh, describe our uh, our planes in our um, uh, in, a, in our X as uh, the zero locus of a corresponding section. So let's let um, DI be the degree of FI. And um, FI uh, determines a section uh, sigma I uh, of sim DI uh, stool um, by sigma i of w is the restriction of fi to w. Um, uh, and then we get a section sigma as the direct sum of these sigma i as a section of the direct sum of these bundles. And then uh, we can make a scheme of the r planes inside of our x as the zero locus of this um, section. So um, scheme of R planes and X. Um, and uh, this is um, the, the zero locus of sigma because um, the plane W is, is in X um, exactly when uh, all of the polynomials um, vanish all the polynomials uh, fi uh, vanish on on the plane. Um, uh, uh, actually, let's write that so because p of w is in x um, if and only if the fi restricted to w are zero um, for all the i. Um, uh, so uh, we we've got um, our r planes in x and uh, for general uh, fi the, these R planes form a smooth uh, scheme of the expected dimension. So this is a result of the bar Manivelle. So for general F1 through Fj, um, Frx is smooth of the expected uh, dimension. Um, uh, and um, let, let's let's write down that dimension so we can see that there there are lots of um, uh, examples of this. So that's the dimension of um, the Grassmannian minus the dimension the rank of this vector bundle v. Let's give um, let's give this up here this um, uh, direct sum of the symmetric powers that sigma was, we'll call that V. Um, and the Grassmannian, if we wanna make an R plane, we need R plus one uh, points. And we get those um, by intersecting an N minus R um, complementary plane with the, with the plane we want coordinates for. And then um, the ranks of these uh, symmetric um, powers uh, are, um, uh, given by uh, bars and shorts. Um, uh, so here's, here's our very explicit uh, expected dimension. There are many infinite families where um, uh, this um, would be zero and so give a count. So let's ask the question, when delta equals zero, um, just how many R planes are there? So sorry, um, Kirsten, I'm, I'm also going to ask if uh, in a couple of minutes, a couple of uh, later people are still coming in. So when they're, everyone's in, I'll just ask if you wouldn't mind going to the top and just quickly skimming over to catch everyone up. Is that okay? I'll let you know. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Ravi also mentioned this before, um, but uh, I, I like questions a lot. I'm a Stanford grad. I'm, I'm expecting uh, to, be, to be interrupted. Um, uh, so, so how many R planes uh, on X? Um, so uh, um, there's a, a tool uh, to, to give us a, a number. So let's uh, let our, our field Kirsten? be algebra. 
Yes. Can you say above when you were defining sigma equals zero, what, what is that a subscheme of when you're saying fr of x is sigma it's equals zero? Grassmannian. So we've got a section of a vector bundle on the Grassmannian. And Thanks. Um, uh, um, so the th this vector bundle on the Grassmannian um, uh, that uh, we were discussing uh, has uh, an Euler uh, number or Euler class, and uh, an Euler class is a characteristic class for for oriented vector bundles, and all vector bundles over C um, are oriented and they have this nice canonical orientation. Um, and uh, of the uh, many constructions of the, the Euler class, um, we have that we can compute it with uh, a section. And if the, the zeros are isolated, so they have neighborhoods around them that have, have, have no other zeros in them, then this number can be computed as a sum uh, over uh, P, uh, uh, where the section vanishes, let's we can call it W. Um, of a uh, of a local contribution uh, at the point. So um, uh, when uh, so generically the zeros. Um, of sigma are simple because we just saw that theorem of debar manivelle that said they were that it was a smooth scheme and so in particular that they're, they're simple zeros with separable uh, residue field extensions and anyway c doesn't have any any field extensions um, so then this gives uh, um, uh, a single um, count of one uh, the uh, and we see that the the Euler number is the number of R planes um, in X. Um, so uh, let's let's look at this first um, equality. Um, this one one uh, implies that this this number, the number of R planes in X, only depends on the degrees of the FI and not on the FI on the DI and not on the F1 through uh, FJ. And where do we get this? Well, there, there are other constructions of the Euler class that imply, um, that imply one. Um, all right, let's, let's move, move forward. So we, we had a count over an algebraically closed field and we have uh, an Euler class applying to uh, vector bundles. So we could also take the R points of the Grassmannian. So we could have, um, we could use the same Euler number for K equals R. And now um, we need to assume that we have an orientation and at least that our V, which was the direct sum of symmetric um, products, uh, orientable. This is a parity condition that's explicit to write down. And then we can go and do the same um, uh, thing up here. So we can uh, just copy this. Um, uh, and now these are going to be the R points, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, this um, local degree, uh, so locally, sigma is going to look like some function from an affine space to an affine space, and it'll have um, coordinates. And then we can take a Jacobian determinant as um, uh, these partials for the components. Since we had a sigma lower i, we'll call it sigma upper i for the components of the, um, of the function a and a n um, x j. And then, oops. So, so uh, Curzon, maybe now is a good time. It'll give people a good excuse to ask you, uh, to review everything, ask you questions. Would you mind, like, 
not just this instant when you're mid equation, but uh, going back and doing a quick, a quick review and glance. Thanks. Great. Um, so uh, this degree is, is going to be the sign of the Jacobian. So we've got a sum over the R planes and X of the sign of this Jacobian is what the, the topological Euler number for this R oriented um, uh, vector bundle is when you apply this Poincare Hopf um, formula. And let's, uh, as, as Ravi suggests, we've decided that we're going to count um, uh, R planes on complete intersections. Um, and uh, so we gave ourselves a complete intersection X, which was the zero locus of some, some Fi. And uh, the um, R planes inside X is the, um, the, the zero locus of a section of an associated vector bundle, this vector bundle V, these symmetric powers. Um, uh, this, this zero locus, it's, it's smooth of the expected dimension. And um, when, it's, um, when it's zero, we're going to count um, the points. So we just did that for um, the, the complex points. And we had this great orientation over, over C, and we got a lot of, a lot of ones. Um, and now uh, what we've got in the, the case over R is um, signs of a, of a particular Jacobian determinant generically. Um, this is at the very least less than or equal to, um, the, and these are now R planes over R, so just R. We had decided up top that we were gonna allow R planes defined over an extension field, um, but as we're taking R points and applying a topological characteristic class, um, we're counting these folks here. And um, so this is less than or equal to the number of R planes. And um, the example in the title is gonna be taken from work of Finash and Karlamov, which makes lower bounds for an infinite family of um, counts of, of, of three planes. Um, so um, in, instead of going for lower bounds, we're gonna view um, this as a weighted count. And go for obtaining a weighted count, i.e. For, for computing uh, Euler classes. Um, uh, we also had made this um, observation that the, this count only depended on the degrees of the equations cutting out f. And if we call that 2, this, this fact that it only depends on these degrees, so 2 is holding again here. So in the title, when we were counting um, on any seven-dimensional cubic hypersurface, we only cared that it was cubic, and we didn't say which, which cubic equation um, it was um, being cut out by. So here's the example that's, that's going to give us oops, our, our title. Um, so this is Finesh and Karlamov. Um, so for three planes, and they have a whole infinite family um, on, so that, on degree 2D plus one hypersurface in an appropriate dimension. And um, let's take D equals three for, for the title. Then we have the um, Euler number for the complex points of this vector bundle is 321,489. And the um, Euler number for the uh, real points um, is 189. So um, then uh, there's uh, a lovely heuristic that says that analogous results over R and C um, may be realizations of a result in a one homotopy theory. Um, and uh, we have Euler classes in a one homotopy theory. So first, um, it's, uh, it's great that, um, let's say, we have a one homotopy theory, which is already um, an exciting thing to have. So that's so. This is Morel Vavodsky around 2000 or the end of the 1990s. Vavodsky, um, and we have Euler classes um, uh, uh, 
uh, for algebraic vector bundles in this context. So around 2000 or 99 or very close to, to, to this, um, Barge Morel um, have an Euler class and it's been further developed by Fizel, Ashok Fizel, um, Mark Levine, um, and uh, used to study when, when bundles split off a uh, trivial factor. In, um, in Morel's book, he has a, a principal obstruction to, um, uh, to a non-zero section. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, there's an Euler number um, that uh, Jesse Cass and, and I um, defined that has the enumerative interpretation that we started with as a sum of um, local degrees over vanishing of sections. Um, uh, De Glees, uh, Jin, and Khan have a bivariant uh, theory um, uh, worked out in, in uh, motivic homotopy theory that also gives an Euler class. And um, uh, Stanford's own Arpan Raxit, who um, might, uh, might be here, uh, um, uh, uh, um, along with independently with um, uh, Mike Hopkins and Jean-Pierre Serre, suggested a coherent duality uh, way of looking at this um, Euler number. And it was developed in a paper so Hopkins, Mark Levine, so uh, Arpon Raxit and Mark Levine have a paper for the tangent bundle um, uh, for a coherent duality um, uh, point of view. And um, the, the paper that I'm uh, giving a talk on right now with Tom, who's here, uh, also has um, this point of view for um, the coherent duality point of view for, for uh, an arbitrary vector bundle. Um, so, uh, uh, summary of that uh, discussion is that we have Euler classes. Uh, we know that Euler classes are giving us a weighted count of, of R planes. So let's see um, about computing them. And first, before we can compute them, we have to know where they live. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so we have some questions. So a bunch of interesting questions are, are, are popping up. Uh, probably in order, uh, uh, one of them is why is it Euler class I guess first, even classically, give the number of planes on the hypersurface, and then just to uh, ask them all at once that once you enrich it in this way, presumably there's some connection. A1 homotopy theory, technically, people I would say usually people don't think it has any connection to any sort of real reality, but here you're alleging that it does. Uh, and, <laughs> and then finally, why uh, a, que a multiple question from uh, so Maddie, so Maddie asked one, Adam Logan asked, Maddie Weinstein asked one, Adam Logan asked another. Why do you always get one and minus one in this type of calculation? Maybe this question will come up later. Right. Uh, uh, so is it like, what's, uh, I don't even understand that question exactly, but I guess I will later when you yeah. explain what one and minus ones are. Um, that, that's a, the, that's a, a perfect um, question. So we'll definitely get to it. So we'll, we'll ask it again if, um, if the, um, uh, if, if it doesn't, if the um, if if you're not satisfied with the answer, but we'll definitely talk about talk about that. Um, the uh, relationship of the Euler class with the classical counts um, is uh, through this Poincaré hopped formula that says that uh, one way to compute the Euler class is you can choose any section and you can take a sum over a degree for a vanishing. And so since we know that the vanishing of the section happens for these things that we want to count, we then, in, in this point of view on the Euler um, number, we automatically built in the, the, the classical count. Um, the, uh, we'll have um, the, if you, um, let's talk about where these Euler um, classes live and then we'll be able to recover the complex and real, um, the, the algebraic topology Euler numbers for the complex and real points um, in, a, in a straightforward manner. So again, um, if, we, if we don't get to it, uh, uh, please ask again, but I, I think we are about to, to do it. Uh, so I think, uh, thank you. That's, I think I got them, uh, but, but tell me if I don't. Uh, um, 
let's look at where these live so that we can talk about the relationship between um, the uh, these Euler um, uh, let, let's restrict to Euler numbers. So we're gonna so we want to talk about relations between um, this A1 Euler uh, number and the um, Euler classes of really complex points discussed above. So let's um, put ourselves in a situation where we can really talk about um, elements of groups and things. So let's let dim x equal rank v, um, as in our counts. We're going to say that v is relatively orientable. And I'll give you a definition of that. Um, then um, we're going to have an Euler class in um, the growth and vid group of K. So let's define relatively orientable and the growth and vid group of K. Um, so first, um, V over X is uh, relatively uh, oriented by a line bundle, the data of a line bundle um, L on X and an isomorphism um, uh, debt V tensor, the determinant, well, um, omega um, X over K um, is uh, the, the square of L, where omega X over K when X is smooth is the determinant of the cotangent space. Um, um, uh, this is equivalent for because squares of real uh, line bundles are trivial. This is equivalent to the um, the condition of, of being relatively oriented for the for for real. Um, so let's declare victory on what relatively oriented means. Although again, I'm happy to um, to be interrupted. The growth and vid group. Um, so this is the uh, growth and deek fit group. And um, it is um, the group of uh, formal differences of uh, isomorphism classes of symmetric, uh, non-degenerate, um, bilinear, um, Um, uh, pairings over K. Um, over fields, we can diagonalize bilinear forms. So it has a presentation, and this will uh, let us define the ones and negative ones in the question and in the title. So it has a uh, presentation with these brackets A, with A in K star, and it corresponds to the isomorphism class of the uh, form uh, of, on a one-dimensional vector space K, which takes um, X, Y to um, A, uh, X, Y. Um, and then it doesn't have many relations. Um, if we change the basis by multiplying um, by some non-zero B, then A will become A, B squared. So these are isomorphic. Um, and then uh, if you do A plus B, um, uh, and choose one vector to be the sort of one, one, then you'll get a relation of this form. Um, and uh, if you take the, we, we can take a tensor product of forms so we can multiply them. And the tensor product of these one dimensional forms uh, gives uh, a b and um, that's it and this this implies that um, the hyperbolic form um, can be expressed as one plus minus one, but it can also be expressed as a plus minus a um, for any for any non zero a um, so uh, um, if we uh, want to compute in GW of K, um, we need to be able to manipulate um, uh, generators and relations, and there uh, 
a lot of great invariants of quadratic and bilinear forms uh, to help us do this. And, uh, and the, some uh, famous ones from, uh, uh, from uh, the, um, uh, the Milner conjecture have to do uh, with the um, a tall uh, dimension of, of the field, cohomological dimension of the field, and getting um, uh, a, a sequence of, of great uh, relations like that that can be used to decide when certain combinations are, are um, equivalent to others. Um, so uh, um, I, I think it's fair to say that in, in uh, many cases, this is a very computable uh, group to work with. Let's put um, a couple of examples um, down. So we have GW of C. Um, all, um, any two scalars are gonna differ by a B squared. Um, so we have exactly one generator. So we can take uh, just the dimension of the underlying vector space, which is an invariant called the rank, and this is an isomorphism. Uh, Sylvester's theorem lets you uh, um, uh, make a bilinear form over R into a bunch of ones on the diagonal and minus ones. And if you take the number of ones minus the number of minus ones, you get something called the signature. And um, this is a map to Z cross Z and the image inside has a parity constraint, but it's a, um, the GW of R is Z cross Z. Um, for the tall cohomological uh, dimension invariance, we can take uh, fields like um, uh, C adjoin T or um, GW of a finite field. Um, and then the rank and the discriminant give isomorphisms. Um, to um, z cross um, well, z mod two as long as q is odd, and certainly in, in groups like this, we would be very well um, justified in saying we can we can compute. And there's uh, lots of great things that um, one can one can compute with um, uh, with bilinear and quadratic forms. And I'm looking at Daniel Krashen, so. Uh, somebody who can compute lots of wonderful things with quadratic forms is, is, is right there. Um, uh, because of the way um, uh, the um, because of the way the the growth unique bit group, one of the ways that can come up in this context, um, we get transfers. So let's write down some notation for this. If you have um, a finite separable field extension, um, you have a map um, from the growth unique bit group of K of L to the growth unique bit group of K which takes a bilinear form on a vector space and uh, brings it to the composition with a field trace. And this stays uh, non-degenerate uh, because uh, the, the extension is, is separable. Okay, so that's uh, the end of our aside on um, the growth and bit group uh, and relatively orientable. And let's get back to um, counting our planes. Um, uh, so uh, what do we know about the Euler classes of um, the, the bundles of the type V, direct sums of symmetric powers? Um, uh, let's write down some uh, uh, prior work. So in joint work with Jesse Cass, we showed that the Euler uh, number of sim three of the dual tautological is um, 15, one plus 12 minus one um, uh, 
for any field. Um, uh, Mark Levine showed that um, the Euler class of uh, sim 2D minus one of S dual over the Grassmannian of lines in D plus one space uh, is uh, um, this, this number here, which we'll define in a minute, it's the, the skip ones factorial. It's like a factorial one plus um, we'll say EC for the corresponding uh, Euler class over C minus 2D minus one factorial factorial over two. Uh, one plus minus one, um, and here uh, 2d minus one factorial factorial is 2d minus one, 2d minus three, dot dot dot, one, and this is as long as um, uh, the characteristic of k, k a field, characteristic of k does not divide two times 2d minus one, and here EC is the topological Euler characteristic of um, the, 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 the complex points. Um, Actually, a bunch of, bunch of questions, Kirsten. Um, now that, so you said for the real numbers, the one and minus one is just because of, um, because for over the real numbers, we just have an index. We have uh, like, a, uh, like a rank and an index, and that's it in some sense. So allegedly, this is telling us something. So I, I would speculate, and maybe I've even heard you say this, and I've forgotten it. That you, I picture a cubic surface, and whether it's got um, uh, it's got some saddle, it's got I don't know, twelve saddle points, and then fifteen um, roundy points. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, you know, uh, you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, although I'm not quite sure, I'm not sure exactly minutes. what I mean, but something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and then similarly, well, then I get a bit confused. Well, I'm not sure who M is in M Levine, or uh, M dash Levine, but. Uh, uh, Mark, Mark Levine, sorry, oops. Oh, Excuse I got me. it. Okay, oh, that's a, that's yeah, a that's, very important oops. question. It's, it's, this is one person, his name is Mark Levine. I mean, you, oh, you know Mark Levine. Levine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but the 15 and 12, what does that mean? Like, presumably it means something really concrete and that someone, like if yeah, um, 20 so, is real, I can go to my office and, like, and I'll look at it and I'll say, aha, that's the, uh, oh no, now I'm confused. Uh, yeah. Well, that, what does it mean about so, the lines? This, this means that the um, Euler number over uh, of the real points of sim three of the uh, dual tautological is three. So we have that the signature, when K is inside R, then the signature of uh, EV is gonna be E of the R, and the rank is going to be, um, the rank is going to be the the complex e of um, of uh, of VC. Um, uh, so the you you should um, if you believe that they were all going to be ones and negative ones, um, then the fact that uh, you would know the rank and the signature, and you know it's only ones and negative ones, lets you solve for um, fifteen and twelve from the fact that 15 plus 12 is 27 and 15 minus 12 is going to be the, the real count, which is due to, um, so over R, um, these things on the, the Grassmannian of lines is work of a Konek, Telemann, and Finesh and Karlamov. And those numbers, the 2D, um, the, the, these numbers here, show up in, in, in there. Um, uh, so um, from, that, from that perspective, you could, you could see it from the global calculations. I'd also argue that um, you'd like to take your specific cubic surface. And instead of having some section on a moduli space of all lines, you want to take your cubic surface, look at your cubic surface, and um, be able to say what um, elements of the growth unique bit group the lines you have are um, contributing, and you can definitely do that for a um, uh, uh, cubic surface. Um, you can, uh, uh, in fact, as long as I'm, I'm on that, you can also do that for the quintic threefold. So um, Sabrina Pauli um, computes these numbers for these lines 
um, for uh, d equals three and five using so uh, the for the um, for the cubic surface she uses the single equation x y z equals zero but she knows how to attach weights to these big big things of lines so via dynamic intersection and then she also if you gave her not a, a big uh, subset of the Grassmannian with this global um, section on it, but if you gave her a specific quintic threefold and a line on the specific quintic threefold and said, how is this line, how should this be counting? She knows how this is getting counted to. Um, uh, um, uh, so, and then there was one, um, uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, Stephen McKean um, computes the, uh, the points in intersections of um, hypersurfaces, so um, O of nj, so the when gr of zero um, pn um, as products of the, uh, I guess we were calling these i, and he also um, has uh, interpretation not on the Grassmannian but in a given complete intersection um, what these, um, what the points should be con contributing. Um, uh, so we know a whole bunch of things about counting different kinds of planes, especially when they're lines and uh, points um, for complete intersections. Um, so um, the uh, uh, a theorem uh, from this talk with um, Tom Bachman um, uh, is that let's compute all of the um, uh, all of the Euler uh, numbers for this sort of a bundle and see that they are all in fact ones and, and negative ones. So let's let R um, be a ring uh, with um, one half um, in R and we'll let V be this sum of sim D I S dual um, Rn, and we're going to assume that it's let it be relatively oriented with um, rank of V is the dimension of the Grassmannian. Um, so because this is the statement of the theorem, I'm going to also just give the parity conditions for what for what these things mean. So you're relatively oriented if and only if your determinant is a square um, together with, so here's the determinant of those symmetric products. And then the canonical bundle for the projective space gives you another, another n, n plus one. So the relatively oriented condition is this parity condition. And then the dimension condition, I think we already wrote it down, um, is this one. So um, those are those conditions. Also, by relatively oriented, we really have in mind there are exactly two relative orientations over Z, and they'll change the Euler class by multiplying by negative one. So with an orientation defined over Z, orientation. So now we have enough data to have a well-defined Euler class. And what is it? It's the one that has ones and minus ones. So then the conclusion. is that um, E of V is the, um, uh, the Euler number of the complex points plus the Euler number of the real points over two, one plus EC minus ER over two um, minus one. Um, and um, as a corollary from the, um, well, the, uh, for one thing, this gives the title. So, example was this uh, 160,000, um, uh, etc. cetera, um, three planes on a, a seven dimensional cubic. So th there was the example from the title of talk. And we also get um, that as a corollary, that if you give yourself a specific um, uh, complete intersection, if we take the sum over the R planes, 
W in X, the transfer from field of definition of W to um, K of the Jacobian uh, of um, sigma evaluated at the point W is the same quantity. Um, and now here's a, a point that um, uh, uh, I like. Actually, a bunch, of, a bunch of questions related to uh, the statement and the corollary. Uh, the, so you said relatively oriented, so presumably in this case, there's only one orientation possible in some sense, or the answer yeah, is there, right. there's sort of two. There right. are two. Yes, right, yes, one up to a great. Uh, yeah. and, and then the one half in R, the Grothenig width group, can you remind me the coefficients were in Z? Uh, of it, uh, uh, the coefficients were in, in, in Z, right? So that's not why. Uh, so, no, so that's a great question. So the, the one half is so that we can have permission K theory, and we're definitely going to talk about that over the break. And it's probably one, I mean, uh, it would be very nice, and there are plenty of people who are hopeful, and including me, that, that that's just um, uh, uh, irrelevant. So it's an artifact yeah. of the argument, not because it's sort of, you think it's necessarily super relevant. Okay. And then um, what, in the, in the crawler, you, you have the Jacobian. What exactly, can you say, like if the Jacobian is... It, that's another great question. So this Jacobian is just, this is a global thing. We took this Grassmannian and we had this section and we express it in terms of local coordinates that are um, nice with the orientation. And then we take some partials and that's very unsatisfying. If you gave yourself a specific complete intersection and you took a D plane on it, you'd want to know how to count it. So that actually we're going to uh, express. But that's, but that's a, a local, a, but, but you could imagine that's a local question. Uh, and, yeah. and, and then, but does that mean it's a double, this relates to a question that, uh, I think, I can't remember, Dan Dorr may have asked, which is, uh, what is, I mean, if there's a double root, does that mean therefore that's zero? Is that therefore multiple roots always contribute zero? But that can't be. So yeah, over, over um, uh, if, you, if you were over R, then if you had a field, non-trivial field extension, it's contributing zero um, because of the trace. The multiple here in the assumption on the corollary, you're not having non-simple roots. So generically, so, so this is for generic, sorry. For generic x, so then this is um, non-zero because we can't put it in brackets. If um, <coughs> uh, this, what, what I meant by this was the thing in pink, um, uh, we can't put it in brackets if it's zero. There's another recipe um, uh, for computing the local contribution, and it's to um, put this um, Eisenbud Levine Kim Shashvili, that's Harold Levine, uh, not Mark Levine, form instead of the Jacobian. So there, there's another recipe for, um, uh, for weighting multiple roots. Um, and uh, I'd also, I'd like to follow up on um, what you said about imagining that it's a local question. Um, so these things here, these are really not ones and minus ones. Um, I mean, your, um, your complete intersection has no reason to, um, uh, well, so uh, something of a spoiler alert, the way we're going to prove this is with an integrality result. We're going to say all these things are defined over Z, and we're going to want to then get an Euler class that's defined over Z, and these units here, these great units in Z are not very numerous. Um, so for a vector bundle on this Grassmannian here, which is um, manifestly defined over Z, we're going to find this um, global contribution, the, this, this global Euler class here, is going to have to be something that comes from, comes, from, comes from Z. But if you took your complete intersection, you probably didn't make it so that it, it was over, over Z. Um, and so then these pieces just magically add up um, to this <coughs> quantity that has only ones and minus ones in it. And in particular, these are, um, uh, m you know, cool different numbers uh, having to do with your, your complete intersection. And uh, as, as Ravi just said, you could imagine that this is actually um, uh, a local um, 
something that can be computed locally. So a question that I do not know the answer to except in specific cases is how do you express this Jacobian in terms of the geometry and arithmetic of the plane inside your specific complete intersection. So in terms of the arithmetic geometry um, of P inside um, X. And there are specific answers um, to this. So there are answers, so over R, there's uh, Finesh and Karlamov. So for little r is one, um, uh, have these Segre indices and Velshenge, um indices that they uh, define and, and show are equal. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Sabrina Pauli, uh, Stephen McKean um, have answers in, in their specific cases and um, Jesse Cass, um, uh, and, and I did it for the uh, cubic uh, surface. Um, but for in general, including for the uh, three planes in a cubic sevenfold, what, how would you locally take your cubic sevenfold and look at your three plane and decide what this, um, what this trace was? Um, given how pretty the answer over R is for all the R equals one, it's, uh, it's tempting to think that there's also a pretty answer to this question here. But it won't appear in this talk. Um, what will is um, uh, the proof of, of this result, which will be by um, an, an integrality uh, statement. But this would be a good time to, to take the break. OK, everyone, uh, I, will, I, I first have a quick question, Kirsten. Um, can you tell us what sort of vector bundles on what sort of spaces you expect this sort of integrality result where you always get ones and minus ones uh, would hold for? Ones over Z. So if you have, uh, yeah. But like what sort of problems? Like um, was it special to, to, this, um, to this symmetric powers of the dual of the tautological bundle on the Grassmannian? Or can you imagine, do you know other sort of enumerative problems where this holds? Um, I guess, uh, you know, in addition to symmetric powers, we've got um, uh, uh, alternating, we've got determinants of S dual, we've got, so that they're, they're like the, the meeting, so Schubert type problems uh, sound like a good place to get a lot of defined over Z things happening. Um, uh, and a good place to not get defined things over Z that I, um, uh, you and I talked about before, and um, is the uh, if you want uh, to count um, rational degree d rational curves through three d minus one point. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions, or we'll take a quick break. Actually, I have a I have a quick question. Uh, really, so a naive question is. If all you had to do is turn things over, are you saying if I have any numeral question over Z, that makes sense? And then automatically I can just get an analogous theorem of what you're about to prove by simply counting over Z and counting exactly. Yes, and then it says something about finite fields. Oops, Ooh. that was not what I was expecting to happen. Something ah. weird happened. Okay, cool. Um, well, but, will you talk, uh, you'll talk about that more later? Uh, no, I'm not gonna talk about that, but that, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I, this is, I you know, what's happening over R and over C is then dictating behavior over any other field, which is kind of cool. And it's really, it's these sums. They're interesting little local contributions that aren't ones and negative ones, and they're happening over any field you choose, and yet somehow the behavior over R and C is, it's, um, is coming in. It's uh, like, I don't know, it reminds me of how in a tall cohomology you get that two uh, everywhere that, you know, even though it's just sort of a dimension of C over R, but you, know, you didn't really, Can you say how it dictates things over finite fields? How it, what does it give, um, what yes, does it give you over that, finite fields? Yeah, so then, um, uh, so here, um, what we, we get one more Z mod two factor. I think oh. you're no longer we can't see. screen sharing. Right. Okay, it'll start in one second. And 
So here we have um, for the finite field, we have one more um, Z mod two. And that comes from uh, taking the discriminant. So for um, uh, the, the, the discriminant would be um, negative one to this, and it'll be plus or minus one, just depending on whether this is even or odd. And then that meant when you multiplied the, um, the discriminants of each of these terms, they would have to add up to one, I mean, they'd have to multiply out to one or, or minus one. And one or minus, minus one may or may not be a square in FQ, and trace forms are, when you take the, or a finite field, if you take the degree D extension, that'll swap whether um, the Jacobian is a square or a non-square whenever D is even, and it'll stay the same if D is odd. So this, this does something very understandable over, over finite fields. And it gives you a parity condition on how many of these can um, be square or non-square over um, different rank field extensions. Thanks. Can you also say what is EC and ER in the theorem? E of V is a bilinear yeah. form. Right. So then uh, EC is an integer, and it is um, the topological Euler number of we take the complex points, and there's a canonical orientation, and so there's a, a canonical integer that is the Euler number. And ER, we've chosen an orientation. It's this. It's, it's one of the two. Um, and this is then the topological Euler number of the, the real points. Is this the same as some churn class? Yes. So this is the top churn class. And there are two different versions of top. I saw some people laughing at the pun. Yes, so this is top, topological and the highest number. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, thank you, Christian, for a great first half uh, or first uh, portion. So we'll take maybe a, a 10 minute break and come back at what is 12, 12 p.m. Pacific time um, and hear the second half of Kirsten's talk. So thanks again. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. So uh, we're gonna get started now for uh, Kirsten's second half. Kirsten? Thank you very much. Um, uh, um, I'm sharing my screen. Um, uh, and again, this is this is joint work with uh, Tom Bachman, um, who, if he's still up in Europe, um, is is here. And all right, oops, that's not what I want. There we go. Um, uh, okay, so this is um, is, is so we're going to prove an integrality result, and and we'll uh, sketch the proof of this theorem. Uh, I have to um, admit that I can tell looking at my notes that we're actually not going to make it to the end. I think I'm just going to keep going forward and then we'll probably have one of those moments where we just kind of cut off and, and that'll be a little bit anticlimactic, um, but at least it'll be comprehensible. Um, and no, maybe I'm making the wrong choice here, but... Yeah, I mean, I mean, don't go, I mean, yeah, yeah. not that you should go over, but I feel like you shouldn't just end mid-sentence. I feel like you, obviously... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try. All right. Uh, so we're going to um, use, uh, um, let's let X be smooth and proper um, uh, over uh, Z adjoin one over D factorial. And um, D is unfortunately going to be greater than or equal to two. And we'll let um, V um, be a, a relatively oriented, rel or relatively oriented uh, vector bundle. Uh, on X with the rank of V equal to the dimension of X, um, then the uh, Euler number is um, 
um, can be expressed as integer combinations of minus one to uh, D inside the growth and David group um, of, uh, of K for, for any, any field. So, um, or K a ring, so say R um, ring, um, uh, uh, gee, um, uh, let's just, let's just say K of field. Um, so K of field containing, um, so Z one over D factorial inside K field. Um, and then if, if D is equal to two, we can uh, be stronger. So we were saying that the, um, these, generator, the units in Z one over D factorial um, are giving the generators that are gonna express our, our Euler class. And if D is equal to two, there are actually only two possibilities. So then either we have um, EV is the um, answer for our, our previous theorem, this EC plus ER over two, one plus EC minus ER over two, minus one, or it's the same thing, except you subtract one of the ones and you add a two. So minus one or minus one plus two. Um, uh, and um, secretly, we're thinking that if we were actually defined over um, Z, as opposed to Z inverted something, we are not allowed to have um, this second possibility but the, the absence of permission K theory over Z is, is making this theorem get, get stated, um, is making this theorem get stated with D greater than or equal to two. Um, uh, so then, um, so theorem one from theorem two, so when, when V is above, as above, you eliminate second possibility to prove it for theor the theorem above, um, eliminate, using um, a characteristic class approach of Mark Levine. Eliminate second possibility using characteristic class um, approach um, like Mark Levine's in the case of R equals one. Um, uh, and uh, this uses characteristic classes and um, work on characteristic classes of Mark Levine and Anna Nevsky. Um, and um, uh, Panin um, and Vent. Um, uh, so let's concentrate on, um, on, on theorem two. Uh, so um, uh, to, to prove theorem two, uh, we had listed a bunch of uh, Euler classes, and um, the Poincaré Hopf style uh, one that um, uh, Jesse Cast and I had um, worked on has this obvious enumerative interpretation. Um, uh, however, um, all of the others um, are more suitable for um, integrality or even for showing uh, independence of, of section. So we'll show that several of the um, Euler classes we talked about are equal. Um, and, and get the result. Uh, so about um, proof of theorem two. Um, so let's let S be a scheme uh, and uh, maybe assume quasi-compact, quasi-separated, a finite uh, crawl dimension. And um, we'll let smooth S be the category of smooth schemes over S. And let's um, uh, 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 talk about um, uh, cohomology theories and say what we need to have a cohomology theory. So a cohomology theory um, con E uh, consists of um, assigning an abelian group, so to every smooth scheme and um, 
v over x, let's actually let it be a virtual uh, vector bundle. Let's, uh, we have an associated abelian group E, V, X, like our normal cohomology groups, V would just be a number, but the rank of V gives us a number. Um, uh, so we have some, some abelian group there. We want a class one in E zero of X, and we wanna have pullbacks and, and um, push forwards when, when appropriate. So we have pullbacks. Uh, so we have F um, Y to X and V over X, then we can have a pullback map from E V X to E F star of V Y. And then um, we've got to push forward. Um, so uh, if we've got a smooth and proper map, Um, uh, then we've got a, um, a push forward from E of, we pull back V and um, we add the relative, um, the sheaf of relative differentials of Y and um, that maps to uh, E uh, VX. And um, so in addition to smooth proper maps, um, in making uh, coherent duality type arguments, we often use um, uh, closed immersion. So let's also give ourselves y in x, a regular closed immersion. Then we have a push forward from E f star v, and then minus the, um, uh, the normal bundle of uh, y and x. Um, so uh, uh, um, this, is, this is coming up from, um, from uh, the cotangent complex of, um, of, of y over s of y to uh, e v uh, uh, x. And um, uh, here are some uh, examples. So um, we can take, if, if K is inside C, we can let E V of X be the ordinary singular cohomology of the, um, of the complex points. And um, if K is inside R, um, uh, uh, we're going to want orientations around, so we're going to take Z mod 2 uh, coefficients, H, um, of the R points with uh, Z mod 2 coefficients. Um, we could have Chow groups. So E, V, uh, X. Um, uh, uh, would be the, um, the Chow group of co-dimension uh, rank V uh, cycles on X. So we're still um, only recording things about the rank of, of V. Um, that'll change right now. We can take oriented Chow groups. Um, so there's some notation for this. We've got E, V, X as uh, Chow Twiddle um, of, uh, the, um, of co-dimension rank of V cycles in X twisted by determinant V. And if we're ignoring the twist, a uh, heuristic for what this is, is our equivalence classes of formal combinations where we take um, sums, we could have them Z, so Z is a um, subvariety of co-dimension rank of V. So sometimes the co-dimension varieties of, of a certain rank are denoted with this upper parentheses. So X upper parentheses rank V is these um, uh, co-dimension V varieties. Uh, BZ, where BZ is a bilinear form on the function field of, of Z. 
and um, you can have bilinear forms that are twisted by um, uh, determinants and um, uh, so an, another uh, cohomology theory um, uh, that we'd like Euler classes for um, are these oriented Chow groups and then there's Hermitian K theory Um, and we've seen we want one half in in our base scheme, um, and uh, so let's let e v of x be um, so Hermitian K theory. Um, let's just denote that uh, K O rank v of x and then twist it by determinant of v. So as an example, let's let x um, uh, be smooth affine. We, we were saying they were smooth schemes anyway. Um, then this is the group completion. Of the bilinear forms, uh, you know, on, on projective modules, so group completion of isomorphism classes. Um, of uh, um, This is a projective module. Oops, I'm overusing V. So let's call it a projective module. And we've got a symmetric non-degenerate form uh, whose target isn't the structure sheaf, but, but this determinant. So isomorphism classes of symmetric non-degenerate. Um, uh, so um, for example, we've got um, uh, KO of spec K is the growth and decbit group of K. And um, we also have KO um, in degree zero of Z one over D is the growth and decbit group of Z one over D, which is generated by those classes that um, we had in our, uh, in our integrality result, generated by um, minus one to D. So um, there's this hope that um, when one half is not in O of S, this is still possible. And that there's a bunch of folks working on it, including Marcus Fitzbeck, um, Baptiste Calmez, Emmanuel Dotto, Jonathan Harpez, Fabian Hebestreit, Marcus Land, Christian Moy, Dennis Nardin, Thomas Nicholas, and uh, Wolfgang uh, Stein. Um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, the, um, bilinear forms and characteristic two, they're interesting, exciting, hairy, uh, hairy objects. So th there's a, um, uh, uh, another example of a cohomology theory. Um, we clearly don't have time to talk about orientations. So let me uh, tell you uh, the barge Morel Euler class. Um, so uh, Euler class, uh, barge Mazel, barge, Morel and um, uh, other folks have worked on, worked on it. Fazel, Ashok, Fazel, um, Mark Levine. Um, uh, um, and so uh, we've, we take our cohomology theory um, and uh, uh, let's the, um, let's say X and uh, smooth S, V over X uh, vector bundle, sigma X V a section, for instance, it could be the zero section, then we'll have an Euler class, we'll call it V twiddle. This was gonna be notation when we were gonna sketch the entire proof of the theorem, um, which I, I think we're not getting to. Um, it's uh, the, the push forward, the pullback of the push forward of one uh, under the section. Um, uh, so uh, one of the nice things here is different sections are, are uh, homotopic. So we're going to get the class, if we change the section, um, uh, um, their uh, compatibility um, with, with base change. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do is is show that um, uh, that that this Euler class agrees with um, 
uh, the um, some of the others mentioned. So maybe maybe I'll end with um, uh, uh, with this. So um, theorem two is uh, reduced uh, to showing that a certain push forward. So if we let pi be the structure map to, to S, we want to show that pi star of E twiddle V sigma is this um, sum over these local degrees where the section vanishes when you have a non-degenerate section. And um, one can show that uh, this, um, uh, this push forward um, can also be gotten by, if you take the zero locus, so let's let sigma be a section with only isolated zeros. Then we have its zero locus. So we have Z as the zero locus of sigma sitting inside X. And we've got, um, let's see, um, Um, we'll call this pi z, uh, then um, uh, uh, we show um, that this is a push forward of a, of a class that can reasonably be called one, and that this is also the sum over these local indices of um, uh, a specific recipe in commutative algebra. Um, uh, so this is a Z, this is pi sub Z push forward here. And then there's um, this eisenbud levine kim form or a sheja stork form with an approximating section with some local coordinates. Um, and so then that implies uh, uh, the, the previous. Um, thank you very much, I'll, I'll stop here. Great, let's all unmute ourselves and thank uh, Kirsten for a great talk. Hey, are there